Welcome! Yes! We are in lecture number 16. Yes! We're doing 1 Corinthians part 2. I hope you had a chance to listen to part 1. Yes! And number 15. It was good. It's only an hour long. So it's not that long that you can't really sit down to it. This one is only 58 minutes, you know, long. So it's not that long. But I want you to pay attention to it, okay? Learn something from it. Because it's good. It's good teaching. It's good teaching to have somebody explain you um, the breakdown, a summary of the New Testament. It's really good. So take notes. Take out your paper. Take out your pencil. If you need a drink, get it now. So you don't have to stop. In case you're thirsty, you could just sit down and, you know, sip and write down your notes. You know what I mean? And Get yourself ready for the word. This is the meat. That, that's the meat of life. They're giving to you free of charge. Meat of life. So therefore, um, you got to start doing it. You know? Take notes. Take your paper. Write it down. And also, I want you to share this page. So other people could know about the word of God. You know, because that's what we're here for. To teach the word of God and to share it. So other people could... Who know it and, and, and grow in their faith. This is part of evangelizing. That's what we're doing as a team. We are evangelizing. Tell people about the word of God. Also, like this page. Subscribe to our page. Like it as a way to encourage us to, so we know that you there and we're not doing it for nothing. You know what I mean? So, like it. And, and subscribe to it. So, next time we're doing the next video, you know when when it's already uploaded, okay? And if you can, donate. Donate from what God has given to you. Because everything in this world belongs to God anyway. Since we can't take it with us, we might as well share it. Share what God has given to us so we could help others in need, okay? Peace be unto you. Listen to 1 Corinthians part 2 at this moment. Take notes. It's very important to take notes so you can go back to it. Peace be unto you. This is lecture number 16. We're continuing our overview of First Corinthians. Uh, this is part two. And as we were doing in the first lecture on First Corinthians, lecture 16, we're looking at this book uh, chapter by chapter, basic overview. I want to remind you that, again, Kostenberger does something similar, so I, I, I would encourage you to read through his material as well. He brings out some very good points uh, concerning uh, the issues in this epistle of the Apostle Paul. And again, by way of review, uh, the Corinthian church was a very wealthy church, had a lot of, a lot of ability, a lot of gifts, giftedness. The Apostle Paul references this in chapter 1. The city of Corinth was a very immoral city, as well as a very wealthy city, and so it posed significant challenges to this Corinthian body of believers. And we find in this epistle Paul having to deal with a number of unfortunate problems within the church. There were factions that were aligning themselves behind different personalities. There was immorality of the sort that was not even known among the Gentiles. There were uh, conflicts going on between fellow believers, lawsuits, and uh, issues concerning spiritual gifts, who's got the better gift. Then there were weaker brothers and stronger brothers that were going at it. So you had those uh, interpersonal problems. Uh, on top of that, you had doctrinal error issues, which we'll look at here later. People were denying the resurrection. So the Corinthian church was very much a troubled church. As we mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, Paul wrote more letters to this church than to all the other churches that he started. Four that we are aware of. Two we have. One, Paul refers to it. The other one, uh, there's some debate about it, but uh, I would say that we have at least three for sure and possibly four. But the point of it is, this church struggled. And it struggled in many ways comparable to the struggles we see in modern churches. Uh, the church today in our culture is faced with some of the most uh, significant 
difficult challenges that I have ever encountered in my reading of, of the church in history. Uh, technology alone has created an environment where people are subject to all kinds of temptations and issues that really can work negatively against them uh, spiritually. So we, we are faced with challenges today that, for those of you that are like my age, I'm in my 50s, for those of you that are that grew up or were born the, the baby bar, the baby boom generation, I should say, we didn't face the things that our kids are facing today. So uh, these things find their way in the church. We're tackling moral issues in the general culture that are terribly divisive and difficult and challenging and are creating some real uh, problems even within the church because there's moral confusion among the people in the evangelical community. There's doctrinal confusion and we see it all the time. All you have to do is go to a local Christian bookstore and just see what the popular books are. And unfortunately, you're going to see a lot of material being read by believers that uh, you would never preach or teach that probably from your pulpit, at least I hope you wouldn't. So we are encountering in our church today moral and doctrinal issues that are not unlike what the Corinthian church was facing. And it requires a very well-established, confident, biblically grounded leadership to ensure the well-being of the congregation because... Again, uh, we're living in an age where we are being pushed, pushed, pushed very, very um, vigorously by the world. And tragically, based on the reading that I've done in magazine articles, and journals, and books uh, coming off the press, the evangelical church today, to one degree or another, is succumbing to the... Uh, to the siren call of the world, if you will. And there are some moral issues where the church is even trying to justify now moral problems that 50, 60 years ago would be considered absolutely appalling or unthinkable. So the church has to set a standard, and that standard has to be grounded in Scripture, and we have to maintain that standard even if it brings upon ourselves criticism from the world. Because we are stewards of the church, we are responsible as pastors and elders and deacons, those of us in teaching positions, we, are, we have a moral mandate, we have a mandate from the Lord to be good stewards of the church. And people depend on our teaching for guidance and instruction, so we have to make sure that we're following uh, Scripture as accurately and as carefully as as possible. So having said that, uh, we're picking up in chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at briefly verses 13 through 20, where Paul talks about the proper use of our physical bodies. And again, he's dealing with a church that has already demonstrated moral failure not only on the part of the person actually engaging in it, but on the part of the church for condoning it. And so this has brought in leaven, if you will, to the church, when it's now starting to spread and corrupt this church's perspective on who they are in Christ and how they should be conducting themselves in such a way that exhibits in their behavior a true identity in Christ. And this is reflected in their physical or I should say, in how they can, how they manage their physical, their physical bodies. So, looking at chapter six, verse thirteen, Paul says, "Foods for the body, and the body for foods, but God shall destroy both it and them." Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now, uh, let me note here. And we'll talk, we'll see this more in chapter 7. Studies have been done statistically that within the evangelical church, especially within the youth end of things, sexual immorality is unfortunately uh, of the same level that you would find it, or has been, that you would find it 
among non-believing uh, people. So the church at large, and the research has been done, it seems to bear up, at least the evidence seems to show that the moral state of the church is in trouble. I saw this in my own ministry where we had Christians living together. And I, in our church, we had to go to those folks and let them know that living together, engaging in sexual activity in an unmarried state was morally, biblically unacceptable. And that we admonished them to get married or to discontinue living together. Now, someone may say, well, what right did we have to do that? Well, first of all, as a Christian, you don't have the right to engage in behavior that is clearly contradicting to the biblical truth. So right there, uh, we're not our own, we're bought with a price, therefore we're going to glorify God with our bodies. Now, what has God put in place to help bring that truth to bear? Well, he's put in place the local church. He's put in place the leadership of the local church. There are those authority structures that God has placed over Christians who choose to participate in church, and hopefully uh, that is the case. And those authorities have an obligation not only to be biblically grounded, but also to manage the church properly. And that includes maintaining doctrinal integrity and moral integrity within the congregation. So if a businessman is cheating his customers and the leadership of the church find out, and they investigate and, and, and learn that that is true, it is the obligation of that leadership to go to that Christian businessman in their congregation and admonish him to be honest in his dealing. If a couple is living in sin, they're living together, engaging in an immoral uh, sexual activity, unmarried, it is the responsibility of the leadership of the church to go and admonish that couple to uh, discontinue that kind of behavior, as with any other sin. If a person in the church is abusing alcohol, then it is the responsibility of the leadership to go to them and, and help them you know, learn how to manage their uh, their lives better. And so this is, this is the role of the church, and this is the importance of this Corinthian epistle is because Paul is very explicit about the importance of managing our spiritual lives. By that I mean uh, being in, using self-control, being disciplined, being committed and focused in our following Christ and doing everything we can to be uh, examples of upright behavior. And so that's why he emphasizes here in chapter 6, near the end, beginning in verse 13, to manage the physical body. It says here, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. Know ye not who is joined to a harlot is one body? Verse 17, or excuse me, verse 18, flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is outside the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Verse 19, no, what, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. And now in chapter 7, He's going to move into this whole idea of marriage, sexual purity, <coughs> divorce, and the obligation that married people have to each other. And so in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 7, Paul makes it clear marriage is the means by which we do not, or I should say marriage is the means by which we avoid immorality. And because we are sexual beings, that's how God made us, he also provided the means by which we can find sexual satisfaction or uh, uh, practice our human sexuality within the context of a proper marital bond. And that is the, the only legitimate context in which people can uh, 
engage in sexual uh, activity without engaging in sin. And so marriage has many different reasons, or I should say, the reason we get married is not just for sexual uh, satisfaction, but there are other reasons for getting married. And there are good reasons for not being married, and Paul talks about that. And this is something that we, again, in the church have to be very careful about, uh, especially in this day and age where there are more and more singles in our churches. People are not marrying as young as they used to. A lot of people are not getting married until the mid to late 20s, some even much later. And some never do marry. And so we need to encourage single folks to manage their bodies in holiness, in compliance with biblical moral truth. At the same time, we also have to be careful not to put pressure on singles by wanting to know why aren't you married yet, what's wrong, assuming that because they're not married there's something wrong with them or they're doing something they shouldn't. But God has enabled some people to not need to be married. And so Paul even mentions that here, where he says he wishes that some were like himself. And he points out that being married brings responsibilities that tend to take a person uh, away from the church. In other words, the married life uh, requires commitment. It requires time. It's, it's, a, it's a relationship that is very dedicated time-wise. And so a married person is not going to have the flexibility to minister as would, say, a single person, because a single person does not have the burden of family responsibility, or the obligation, I should say. But that being said, it's not this, what he is saying here. That he's not saying being single is better than being married, or being married is better than single. He's merely saying these bring responsibility. There are advantages to one, disadvantages as well. Within the single community, the advantages are more time can be focused on doing the Lord's work. But on the downside, it prohibits any kind of sexual activity. So the natural inclination that one would have have to be managed. There has to be discipline in that area. On the flip side, those who are married enjoy the benefits of being married, but at the same time, they may not be able to do the level of ministry that, say, a single person could do. So there, there are uh, there, there are advantages and there are limitations to either the single state or the marital state. And in chapter seven, the Apostle Paul provides a very good set of guidelines for how to navigate through that. Now he does talk about in verses ten and following the whole idea of a person being married to a non-believer. And I start off in verse 10, he says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, and be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So let the general principle that if you're married, you stay married. Now, Within the evangelical community, there are different views on divorce and remarriage, and we're not in a position to go into that here. But to put it briefly, there are those that do hold the view, and it's a fairly common view, that if there is adultery being committed, if adultery is being committed by one of the partners, the other partner does have the biblical, uh, can get a divorce biblically, and some would even say remarry. There are those who would say that the person can divorce but not remarry. So that's that's a debate in and of itself. There are those who would also say that another grounds for divorce is abandonment. And Paul talks about that in verses 12 and following. But he puts it in the context of the believer marrying a non-believer, and the non-believer chooses to abandon that marital relationship. And if that takes place, uh, what what the, Paul seems to be saying here is that the abandoned Christian, be it a woman or a man, is no longer obligated. And the, there are those believers who, Christian scholars, who do think that what Paul is saying here is, in the case of abandonment, if a non-believing spouse walks away from marriage, then that uh, 
the person who has been abandoned does have the freedom to remarry. Now, there are those who would argue just the opposite, that they don't have the freedom to remarry, but they do have the freedom to divorce. And so, this whole thing of divorce and remarriage is very, very controversial, and it does pose some real challenges for the church. So, this is an area where you will have to be extremely diligent in your study, and do the research and take the time to really look into the issues involved because uh, where you're going to find this to be a, a, a matter of a, a real challenge is at the leadership level. Uh, can any of your leaders be divorced and remarried? If not, do you have a good biblical basis for that? If they can be, again, do you have a good biblical basis for permitting pastors or elders or deacons who have been divorced to serve in those capacities in ministry. And Christians take various positions on that. Chapter 8 deals with Christian liberty, and we talked about this when we went through Romans and did the overview there. So we're coming back to it again, and Paul devotes this whole chapter to the whole question of Christian liberty. And so some of this may be a little repetitious. But I think, uh, I think it'd be good for us to be reminded of what is going on here. Uh, we're not going to read this chapter. I'll leave it up to you to read through the material. But essentially what has happened is there are Christians who have been converted out of pagan, idolatrous worship practices that were prevalent in Corinth. In fact, in the Mediterranean world, it was not unusual to see all these pagan temples and religious sites in various cities. And Corinth was not, uh, was not, our Corinth had its share of them. And so if people were saved out of these pagan practices, there started to be conflict within the Christian community concerning Christian liberty. <clears throat> now Paul talks about idle meat. That is the issue here in this particular uh, church. Believers who were saved out of a pagan practice would be a practice where meat was brought into the temple sacrificed, or an animal brought in, sacrificed, or, or whatever. Uh, the meat was dedicated to a pagan god, and then that meat found its way back into the marketplace in the meat market. Now, where there were those who would go to the meat market, purchase that meat, take it home and eat it, and they had no problem with it. There were others in the Corinthian church who had been saved out of that environment, but their conscience would not allow them to eat that meat because they would have, uh, essentially, it would be as if they were going back into that pagan practice and violating their, uh, <clears throat> their relationship with God. In other words, their conscience prohibited them from eating meat that was sacrificed to false gods. There were other believers who did not see anything wrong with it. It didn't affect them at all. They saw it merely as food. Even Paul himself says he has the freedom to eat meat. There's nothing wrong with it in and of itself. It is not demonic. It's not, it's not uh, inherently evil. There's no such thing as the gods to which it's been sacrificed. There are demonic beings, yes. But the issue now is coming to the Corinthian church, and evidently these two groups were going at each other. Uh, the people that had their, that could not eat meat, sacrificed to idols, and now found its way in the marketplace, were offended by those who could eat meat and did eat it. And so they were stumbling, or they were being put in situations where they... Uh, they were actually falling back into compromise. Now, I want to read from Kostenberger. It's your textbook, page 489. I think he makes a very good, very good 
point, verse 8. He says, Christian rejection of polytheism and the existence of idol gods did not necessarily lead to unqualified approval of eating food formerly sacrificed to idols. Believers needed to be aware that others might follow their example of eating food sacrificed to idols only to suffer a tormented conscience. They ought to be sensitive to how other believers perceive their actions and the potential impact of others following their example. Although some believers might resent this limitation on their Christian liberty, Paul himself willingly sacrificed some of his liberties as an apostle as well. He relinquished his right to financial support from the churches that he served, even though secular examples, Old Testament law, and the teaching of Jesus confirmed his right to that support. Paul also sacrificed other freedoms in order to relate better to the people whom he was attempting to reach. Paul was concerned that some Christian Corinthians viewed Christian liberty as a throwing off of all restraints on their behavior. So, the point of it is, it's like Paul said earlier in this book, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. I can do these things, but does that mean I should? Now, how do we apply this? How does this apply today? How does this apply in our lives? Well, in the Corinthian church, if Corinthians were, in, were in eating idle meat, the weaker brother was aware of it in some way. We're not given the specifics. It could have been the weaker brother was invited to a home, or the weaker brother, and some of this could have even been brought into the church uh, on different occasions. Uh, or these people could have been spotted in the marketplace purchasing the idle meat and consuming it. So there were different ways in which the conflict got, got started. And so what Paul is saying is this. If you, if your weaker brother is, has the potential to fall back into, uh, or let me rephrase it, if your weaker brother has the potential to engage in eating meat that he or she firmly believes would be a violation of their conscience, but they're being tempted to do so by the practices of another believer who is exercising liberty, then that believer exercising that liberty probably should figure out a way to discontinue eating that meat. Now, what I've done with people when this issue has come up, and it, in our culture, it's not idle meat. In our culture, it has to do with alcohol. There are churches where there are a lot of Christians who believe it's okay to drink in moderation. And then there, in that same congregation, there are believers who uh, used to have an alcohol problem. Maybe they've been to Alcoholics Anonymous. And then there are other believers who think it's just flat out wrong to drink, period. So you've got three different perspectives there. But the main perspective has to do with the person who was saved and got into recovery and is no longer uh, drinking alcohol because they can't. Otherwise, they fall back into alcohol abuse. So, how does the believer in the church who thinks it's okay to drink in moderation conduct himself or herself in that context? Well, here's, here's uh, some options. Number one, be more discreet when you purchase the alcohol if that happens to be your particular viewpoint. Number two, if you're in the company of other Christians, consider the possibility that maybe one of them may be a weaker brother. And there are ways to find out. Ask the person if they're coming over to your home to have dinner. You might like to have a glass of wine for dinner. What you may want to do is not even serve any alcohol at all. Use that as an opportunity to drink something else. If you go out to eat with somebody, same situation there. If, if we are, if we take our Christian liberty to the point where we say, 
I cannot give this up no matter what, then there's a problem right there with with a lack of self-discipline. If we take the attitude, well, I believe I can do what I want. If I want to drink in moderation, it's not my problem if the other person has an issue with it. Then that's a, that's a matter of pride and a lack of real concern for the well-being of another believer. And now we're talking about the weaker believer who, being in our company, could be influenced to violate their conscience and maybe engage in drinking as well. Now that would, that would uh, also include someone who maybe doesn't have an alcohol problem, and never has had, but they are very uncomfortable around the use of alcohol. And so there would have to be uh, some real discretion there. Now let me just say here, I don't drink. I have no desire to. I don't engage in the use of alcohol. <laughs> But I do know from pastoring church that a lot of people in the church do. And so there has to be a way to manage this properly. Now, as far as the illegitimate application of the weaker brother idea, here is an illegitimate perspective. If someone says, it offends me that you shop at Macy's, I think it's wrong for Christians to spend so much money on clothing or other items when they could be giving that money to the needy or the poor or giving it to the church or whatever. Why do you need to spend so much money on nice clothing? Why do you need to drive an expensive car? Why do you live in a large home? Why do you have your refrigerators loaded down with the finest foods? And the list could go on and on and on. And uh, I have had this situation come up where people think that those who have means should restrain themselves in how they and what they do with their means. And all I can say to that is this, that does not constitute a weaker brother, that just constitutes an opinion, a preferential lifestyle choice. If the person wants to drive a Mercedes or a BMW, and live in a nice home, and shop at better stores, then that's their Christian liberty. And we should not, in any way, um, judge them for that. Now, if you happen to think that I don't want to live that way, I think I'd rather live a more frugal, um, restricted lifestyle so that I could use my resources for other purposes, then that's your preference. And that's, that's totally within biblical parameters. But a person, what, what should not happen is the wealthy should not look at those who uh, choose to scale down their lifestyle. They shouldn't look down upon those people as, um, well, they're, they're just not capable of doing any better in life. Why don't you try to better yourself? Those are judgments that should never be imposed on other people. On the flip side, if, if we choose a particular lifestyle, because that's just the way we think we ought to live our lives, then we should do that with joy and trust God to uh, give us wisdom on how to conduct ourselves accordingly. But we should never look down upon those who choose to not live that way. And so uh, this, this here has been and continues to be contentious within the church. And so it's important that we realize that the weaker brother, essentially, in this context, is someone who was saved out of a pagan practice, pagan religious system, that utilized food, meat in particular, as part of its worship service, and that meat found its way in the marketplace. And then you have two perspectives. The weaker brother cannot eat it because it would violate their conscience. And in some cases, it might cause them to revert back to or be tempted to slip back into a lifestyle or practice that would be clearly contradictory to the Christian faith. On the other hand, there are those believers that can eat, that can eat the meat. But if they do so, they need to do it with discretion and maybe in some cases total abstinence. And so we have to be careful not to take this too far because 
if we abuse this passage, we can actually use it to bully other Christians into conforming to a mold that we think they ought to fit into, and that is not what this passage is all about whatsoever. So chapter 9. <clears throat> chapter 9, Paul talks about being all things to all men, and we're starting at verses 19 and going through 27. Paul talks about his approach to reaching the lost. Now when he says he's all things to all men, that by doing so he might win some, Paul is not saying there that he's going to compromise doctrinal or moral integrity, but it just means that he learns how to relate, interact with, engage those that he's trying to witness to or, or uh, minister to. And in doing so, he has the opportunity to write to these individuals. Now he goes on to the end of the chapter and he talks about a very important principle, and that is self-discipline. And he talks about running a race, and that he disciplines his body on a daily basis to make sure that he is staying on course in his spiritual life and in his preaching and teaching. And uh, in doing so, uh, he doesn't become useless or become a castaway, as he put it. So I think the, the admonition there for us as Christian leaders in the church and believers in general is to be disciplined in our daily walk to manage ourselves in such a way that by the end of the day we can reflect back on our lives without regret, saying, I, I conducted myself in an honorable way at work, or at the grocery store, or at the mall, or in school, or in the church, or wherever we were that day. And each day, we purpose in our hearts, as Daniel did, that we are going to not engage in anything that would bring reproach upon who we are in Christ that would have in any way a negative impact on our testimony before those who may learn or already know that we are Christians. Chapter 10, Paul cites an Old Testament example here, talking about Moses, uh, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the open and in the sea, what we're reading from chapter 10, verse 2. They did eat of the same spiritual food. They drank of the same spiritual drink. And they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock is Christ. And then he talks about many of them God was not pleased with, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then verse 6, he says, these are, now these things were examples, our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. So Paul is showing from the Old Testament to his readers that just as believers, those who were following Moses in obedience to their Lord, uh, were following Moses in the Old Testament, there were obligations on them to follow faithfully and to be obedient. And unfortunately, more often than not, it seems, they fell into rebellion. And so God dealt with them, and, and just as he did then, so today, that we need to learn from these examples and how to conduct ourselves in our relationship with Christ, recognizing that when we don't, that may bring God's discipline upon us to get us back into line or bring us back into conformity with, with who we are in Christ and continue to uh, mature us in our faith. <clears throat> now, I want to jump to chapter 11 the Lord's Table, Communion, because this particular chapter is very common, it's a, or I should say it's, it's a very popular chapter to read when our churches uh, perform the communion service or offer the communion service. It's, it's the primary text that we go to that lays out the specific procedures to be followed, and it gives us the theological reasons for communion. And I want to discuss an issue here concerning communion that is quite common in the church. It's, a, it's something I was taught, and it's something I had to rethink, and that is the whole question of who can take communion. 
is there anything that disqualifies a person from taking communion? And when Paul talks about some are uh, asleep, some are sick, or when he talks about not taking communion in an unworthy manner, what exactly is he talking about there? And this gets a little bit, this could, there are two major viewpoints on this. One is, before you take communion, you should examine yourself to make sure that you have repented of and acknowledged any sin or uh, problems in your life. That's one viewpoint. There's another viewpoint that says that is not the issue at all. It had to do with a sacrilegious approach to communion. Now, for umpteen years, I held the view and taught at one time the idea of, or at least I believed it to be the case, the idea that you had to repent of your sin and, and examine yourself to make sure that you don't take communion in an unworthy manner. And after I started really studying this section of scripture, I had to change my position on it. So, uh, I'm going to offer a perspective on this for your consideration as far as what is Paul talking about, what's going on in this particular situation here where Paul has to address the communion service. So let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 11. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man pray or prophesy, having his head covered, dishonor his head. So, uh, Paul is going to be talking about the role of men and women in the church and uh, their perspective, uh, their proper uh, behavior in this particular cultural context. And it has to do with showing respect in the, in the service. Now, after he deals with that, he's going to now deal with an issue in verse 17. And that has to do with the communion problem. Now what he's dealt with part of that is he's dealt with relationships between the men and women in the church, the role of women in the church, and that in and of itself is controversial. And he talks about how men and women are to appear physically, that they're to uh, dress and conduct themselves in such a way that their gender is clearly identifiable. And again, this is a problem we encounter today with transgenderism and all kinds of modifications now being imposed on us by the culture where there's gender confusion. And uh, this has created a very, very difficult and challenging area for the church to, to respond to because more and more Christians in the evangelical community are finding themselves more than willing to accommodate um, practices that Scripture clearly prohibits, and one being homosexuality and all the expressions of homosexuality, and I think by extension, uh, issues where people are trying to deny their gender and, and essentially transform themselves into something that they're not. And so Paul is addressing that here. And then he moves, he makes a clean break, it seems like, and then just moves to a totally different issue that's, that's equally problematic in the church. And he says here in verse 17, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye came together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they who are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. 
For in eating, every one taketh before the other his own supper, and one is hungry, another drunk. What, have ye not houses to eat, and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I praise you not. Now, Paul is pointing out the problem. The problem here is that the Lord's table, as Jesus originally instituted it, has now been corrupted. The Corinthians are taking it and using it not as a communion time, but it's become basically a time for, for uh, partying, eating rich foods, getting drunk. In essence, it's an abusive party atmosphere. It's sacrilege is what it really comes down to. Because those with means, those who can't have good food, are engaging in it, and those that cannot are being left out. So there is a division that is taking place, even within the so-called communion table, that is uh, creating a breach between the haves and the have-nots, if you will. And Paul is appalled at this, and so he's going to correct this problem. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had, broke, had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then it says he did the same with the cup. The cup is the New Testament, and my blood was due as often as you drank it in remembrance of me. So Paul is reiterating what is the proper practice procedure for communion. It has to be focused on Christ. The purpose is to remember what Christ has done for us as individuals, our redemption. And it is not to be a feast or a party atmosphere, especially an environment where drunkenness takes place and gluttony. And so in verse 27 he says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So what's going on here? It is an abuse of the Lord's table. It has nothing to do with, am I taking the communion with some unconfessed sin? Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with confessing our sin. And if a person, in good conscience, cannot take communion because they don't believe they have confessed their sins or they're struggling with the sin issue, then that's their conscience, and I would say, follow your conscience. But... We should not say to people, and again, this is one interpretation, but if you get the commentary by Gordon Fee, uh, he also uh, makes a similar argument. The communion is for us to remember and honor what Christ has done on our behalf as our Savior. It's a commemoration of the work of Christ in my life. Now, in taking communion and recognizing it as such, that should cause me to reflect on what he has done. And in my reflection, I ask the question, has my life been honoring to him? And if not, that could be a time to say, Lord, I want to repent of my sin. I want to use this as an opportunity to really take a, a good hard look at who I am, thanking you for what you've done for me, and, and see it, you know, use that as an opportunity for that kind of approach. But we should not tell people, if you've got un unconfessed sin in your life, you take communion, you're running the risk of doing so unworthily and, and risking illness or death. That's really not what's being discussed here. The illness and death was coming upon those who were desecrating the table by engaging in drunkenness, possibly gluttony, ostracizing other people, and essentially corrupting the procedure and the purpose for the communion service. And so we have to be careful with communion that we conduct it in a way that is honorable to the Lord, the focus is on Christ, and the intent is that every believer who partakes does so as an opportunity to give honor and praise 
and remembrance to what Christ did for them. It's a time to reflect on the salvation experience and the fact that they are adopted children of God. And so the communion is a commemoration of, of that individual act, and it's also a corporate opportunity for the corporate body of believers to come together and in that communion recognize that we are here together as a corporate body because of what Christ has done for each of us individually. Now, chapters 12 through 14, we could spend a week of Sundays on this. So I'm just going to quickly go over this. Essentially, what Paul is talking about is the abuse of spiritual gifts here, and he is trying to correct that. There were those who were proud and arrogant with the exercise of their gifts. There are those gifts that are of a public nature, and then there are those gifts that don't have that public um, presence. And so what he is saying, and what he is trying to get across, is that we need each other. It doesn't matter what our gifts are. We have to respect every single gift that God has bestowed upon the church that he has given every believer. And we respect those gifts, not because they're something we have done, but because these are things that God has enabled us to do. He's given them to us. So when we dishonor somebody because we don't think what they're doing is important, they're gifted, we're essentially saying to God, you made a mistake, or that's not that big of a deal. And so what God wants us to do through Paul here, what he's telling us is these gifts reflect different parts of the body. We can't say to the hand, or I should say the hand can't say to the foot, you're not that important, or vice versa. We, as believers, come together with whatever gifts and abilities God has given us or enabled us to develop, and we bring those to bear for the good of the church and to honor Christ and to be good stewards of those gifts. And that entails respecting and honoring each other. And so in verse 13, or excuse me, chapter 13, Paul inserts this remarkable treatise on the whole idea of what is true love. And what he is saying here is, if you speak in tongues, in the tongues of angels, and you don't have love, you're just making a racket or, or a tinkling symbol. Essentially, it comes down to this. Any gift that is exercised out of selfishness and pride is not accomplishing anything. A gift that we are given, whether it's one gift or multiple gifts, exercised with the idea of love, I am exercising a gift out of love and concern and benefit to the church, to other believers, that is the proper attitude. Because love, and it's when it's properly practiced, is self is self uh, is selfless. It is an exercise of humility. It brings honor to others. It glorifies the Lord. It doesn't assert itself. And as a result of it, it brings harmony and unity to the body. And so this this important chapter, chapter thirteen really is the groundwork, is the basis upon which these gifts are to be exercised with the proper attitude and perspective that we are to be grateful for what we are given, for the abilities we're given, and we're to exercise them with the mentality of being humble, grateful, and, and thrive on the knowledge that what we're doing is benefiting others and not benefiting ourselves. And then in chapter 14, he addresses the whole problem of tongues, which, again, that's not an area we're going to get into details here. But just suffice to say, Paul set certain criteria for the Corinthian church and their practice of tongues, what is permitted, what is not permitted, what constitutes an abuse of tongues, and what constitutes a proper application of tongues. Now, chapter 15 Chapter 15 is critical, because here Paul deals with the whole question of the resurrection. And evidently, Paul's teachers were getting into the Corinthian church and talking and teaching that there was no resurrection. 
both those they were influenced by platonic dualism which condemned or I should say platonic dualism takes the view that the body is evil and it's the immaterial spiritual part that is important. I don't know for a fact if the Corinthians were influenced by that or if they were influenced by some form of incipient docetism which teaches that there was no physical body of Christ. But whatever the case may be, the Corinthians have this idea don't know how widespread it was that the resurrection didn't take place and Paul is horrified by this. And so right off the bat he says, Lord the brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. And then he goes into explaining, once again, that Christ died for our sins, physically, literally on the cross, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead, and there were witnesses to that resurrection. That being the case, Paul is now questioning the Corinthians, why in the world are some of you denying the resurrection? It's an established fact. It's a historical fact. There are eyewitnesses that bear uh, witness to that. Paul himself witnessed the resurrected Christ. And so what he is going to do here in the most uh, critical, theologically rich discussion of the resurrection in all of the scriptures, he is going to make it very clear what are the consequences of denying the resurrection and why do we embrace the resurrection. And simply put, he points out denying the resurrection means that there is no justification. Go back to Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Paul says, Jesus was given up or delivered up for our transgressions, that's the atonement, he was raised for our justification. That is critical. You can't have an atonement without a resurrection. The resurrection completes the work of Christ on the cross. And so to deny the resurrection is to make null and void the atonement. And it is to essentially mean that Jesus is still in the grave. So this chapter deals with a doctrinal heresy that literally gutted Christianity of its essential core tenet. And without the resurrection, this the whole Christian faith collapses. And we're dead in our sins, and there's no forgiveness. And those that have died before us are lost or are hopeless. So this is a horrendous heresy that has made its way into this church. And from what Paul is saying in the first couple of verses here, it's, it's almost like what is wrong with this group that having been taught by the Apostle Paul, they've embraced the gospel, which is the resurrection. They stand on it. And now all of a sudden there's a group of them, again, we don't know how many, that are saying that there is no resurrection. This does not make sense at all. And the ramifications of that particular error are absolutely fatal to the Christian faith. And so Paul reiterates the fact that Christ is raised, we do have hope, and that he goes on to say that he looks forward to the day when his mortal physical body will take on immortality. And so this is an absolutely critical chapter when it comes to the heart and soul of what Christianity uh, stands on, because it entails salvation, it entails future justification, it entails sanctification. Now, when I say future justification, I'm not saying that we're not justified now, but what I'm saying is that our glorification, that finalizes the whole process and program of salvation. We are justified by grace through faith now, completely and totally justified. But we are looking for to the day when we are glorified, and that is the redemption of our body that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8. That is the final salvific 
event for us is to receive an immortal, glorified body. And that's what Paul is looking forward to as well. Lastly, in chapter 16, and this will conclude our uh, overview and look at 1 Corinthians, Paul is giving instructions for uh, the offering that the Corinthian church is going to take to be given to needy believers in the city of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church. And so he's giving instructions here, and these instructions are designed uh, for the express purpose of setting aside an offering so that when Paul comes, he can take that and uh, make sure it's distributed to those who need it. Uh, that would be the brethren in Jerusalem. And so he wraps up uh, his epistle in verse 9 by saying, by verse 19 of chapter 16 by saying, The church of, the church of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you, much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet one another, one another with a holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Amen. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Yes. 1 Corinthians part 2 was really good. I hope you learned something from Paul and what he had to say. And hope you come back again for the next lecture. Okay. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and protect you. Amen. As you go throughout your week, throughout the month, may the Lord bless your home and keep all evil from your home. May everybody in your home be safe and well in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget to like this page, share this page, subscribe to this page, and also donate to this page. Please, I want to hear your feedback. Your address is on the bottom of the page. Please send us a letter, a note, or something. Let us know how this ministry has been a helpful help towards you. And if you need anything, please write us, email us, or something. So we could know that you are out there listening to it and you you learning something and you growing in your faith. Amen. Please, peace be unto you and your home. Shalom.